Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Bucketheads live stream. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, many apologies for being a little bit late. Uh, we are still figuring these things out. We don't have quite a permanent studio set up yet, uh, and we had some technical difficulties this morning. So everything should be good. Uh, if there are any issues, uh, feel free to let us know in the live chat if the audio cuts out or anything weird. Uh, but for now, it looks like we're going. So welcome to the live stream. I'm Andy Brown. And I'm Michael Bassa. And together we are Transmute Pictures. Uh, we are the creators of Bucketheads, A Star Wars Story, and now creating Bucketheads Season 1. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is a Star Wars fan film series that we are creating. Uh, there are going to be five episodes that we're looking to put out for Season 1, 20 to 30 minutes long each. Yeah, and uh, in this live stream we're going to talk about the series itself, and today we have a very special guest with us. We do have a very special guest with us. Today we have Tom Rolfe, who is our uh, visual effects supervisor. Uh, he's been with us since the very beginning. Tom, you helped us uh, immensely on the short film, and you're back for the series, so welcome. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you again for um, working on the short film with us, and uh, it, it's, it's paid off. Uh, we actually went to many film festivals with oh, it. Oh, yes. And it won some accolades speci specifically for visual effects, mm. and several of them. I think we really we had the most accolades for visual effects, so yeah. congrats to you, truly. Uh, where else did we win here? Where, where did you get your awards here? We had Vancouver Short Film Fest. Uh, the Ingenuity Festival and the Grand Teton Film Fest, so... All for visual effects. Major congrats mm -hmm. on that, man. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Well, before we um, get uh, talking with Tom, I think uh, we want to go over some more things sure. with the series and the patient, right? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, so, uh, we should uh, put out a, an express thank you to Shane Molina and Stuart Manson. Uh, these are the individuals uh, who created, uh, was well, Stuart Manson rather, and uh, Anil Sharma created the propaganda poster that we just recently released. Uh, this is for the Patreon uh, individuals, or the patrons rather. Uh, they're getting the poster we released, plus an exclusive version that probably no one but them has seen. So uh, we've got it up there on the right hand side of the screen. And then Shane Molina uh, with Hawaiian Mako Design, who has created both of our posters for the original Bucketheads and Season 1. Uh, and we also recently announced that he's doing some other artwork specifically for the patrons, exclusive stuff for them. So if you guys want to get in on these great uh, rewards we have, please check out our, our Patreon page and uh, help us make this project. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I think that is it for housekeeping. Actually, one more thing. Mm. Uh, at the last stream, we said that we would uh, deactivate the super chats and the uh, super stickers. Several of yes. you have expressed that you very much like these as an option, so we re-enabled them. Uh, feel free to use them. Um, I'm going to stress again that the best way to help the series is through our Patreon, just because uh, the fees are much lower that, that way. When you do a super chat, a lot, uh, almost half of it goes to YouTube. Mm. Uh, but we still appreciate any contribution that you give us, obviously. And I should have mentioned too, uh, if you are looking to check out the Patreon page, if you do want to donate to the project, uh, there's a uh, link in the description of this video at the bottom, so you can go check it out there. Yeah, all right, let's uh, dive into, into visual effects. Let's do yeah. it. So first off, Tom is going to start a new tradition with us on the show. I've yes. been bringing every time my prize little Star Wars possession here, my Yuri Ashigaru Stormtrooper. Uh, Tom, today you're, you're starting this tradition where we're going to have our guests bring some unique memorabilia or, or cool Star Wars thing they have. So what do you got for us, man? I've got this very rare uh, Episode 2 Russian doll set, actually, that my wife bought me many years ago from Estonia when she was there. From Estonia? Yeah, wow. So, um, you can see there's many layers to it. Went that is hilarious. There. I've never seen that before. I mean, I've seen yeah, Russian I mean, dolls, but I have yeah. not seen the Star Wars Russian dolls. How far doll. does it go? How far? Are you three layers in right now? Oh, my God. oh yeah. it's so tiny. And there's the C three PO in the <laughs> And there's different artwork on on each yeah. each one of the layers. And I just always fascinated me this <laughs> this <laughs> memorabilia. So that's awesome. Wow. I want you to all the way have, from Estonia. Yeah, have that on your desk for now. I'm gonna have to ask it back eventually. Yes, we will. Like, we will display it, it proudly. We've never, seen, we've never seen these anywhere else. Reach. Oh, it's so... Oh, oh we, we kind of got some crossover there. Uh, yeah, here, I'm on, I'm on a screen. This is a social distancing studio still. Yeah. This is so visual gonna, effect. Yeah. Yeah. That way. We're going to display our, uh, Tom's awesome little uh, uh, Russian doll set here today beside the Yuri Ashigaru guy. Oh, we should put that camera down next time. Well, that's where it is. 
You get, you get Anakin. No, it's there. Uh, Anakin. Uh, can you put it on, on your phone? Or oh, maybe. Phone? Yeah, here we go. Copy that. Oh, here's, one more. Here's another one. Phones. <laughs> They're useful for multiple things. Nailed it. All right. We got it. We got this, guys. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, let's get into some questions. Um, Tom, you get the same first question as every other guest of right. ours. What's your favorite Star Wars moment? Not film, moment. Moment. It's got to be... Um, it's the end of Return of the Jedi, I think. Mm. That moment. But I don't want to talk about it in too much detail because my kids... I'm currently re-watching all the films with my kids, as in I'm re-watching it, but they've never seen them. So we haven't right. got to that yet. So I don't want to spoil it. End it's just, of Return uh, of the Jedi. Okay, so we won't spoil this one. Hopefully yeah. our fans I was, was going to say, oh, you know, as a joke, um, spoiler alert, and talk about it. Then I realized... <laughs> Hi kids. Family uh, first, man. Family first. Again, yeah. no. So, Hopefully our viewers have seen and uh, uh, returned yeah, the Jedi. So it's just because it's just. Well, I mean, part of the reason was I, I saw it when I was five in the cinema. One of the first films I saw. I'm amazed that you remember uh, this. Yeah, it, it, it was it had a big impact on me. But right. um, just the imagery and the design of the film, and uh, I didn't realize at the time it was such a pivotal point of the trilogy, obviously. But um, so that's another reason it kind of stuck with me. I just, I was just. I mean, the lightsabers just as a kid I just couldn't understand how they were done and yeah so it was just the whole part of it being one of the first films I saw in the cinema um, it probably scared me to death a bit the rancor scene so uh, right as a kid but um, the Emperor as well but yeah I loved it still so. did you know did that kind of like spark your interest in visual effects or film yeah. at that point or? yeah I mean that was that was what kind of got me into doing this actually I was, I was quite lucky at a young age it made me want to make film. I didn't know I wanted to do visual effects at that point but it made me want to make films so That's... that inspired me to make films as a as right. a kid and at university I directed a few films and then got the chance to you know, do visual effects so. wow. you knew from a very young age yeah, yeah I don't think I knew tell I think I've said it before, but it was grade 11 for me, so I was like 16, 17 when I knew. But uh, yeah, good for you, man. Yeah, so now you've been working in visual effects for quite a long time, and yeah. you've worked in quite some memorable films, mm -hmm. and uh, also bigger name films that probably most people have seen themselves. Um, is there any uh, film that stands out to you that you really uh, enjoyed working on? Um, probably the film that immediately springs to mind is uh, Return of the King and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Oh, wow. That was, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've seen your IMDb, obviously. It's yeah. a, it's a long so time ago. I'm like ago. going through my mind, like, which, is, which one of those it was 2004, amazing. so it was kind of a long, or three, or four. Yeah. Um, I mean, because of being able to work in such an amazing environment, yeah. Peter Jackson just walking around without any shoes on. Um, the, the screening room was this huge kind of theatre that he'd built for himself with all these crazy decorations, the wet of workshop. So it's the experience of working on such an iconic film and quite early in my career too. Um, mm. and, and then living there uh, in, in New Zealand. So all those as aspects kind of. Could you tell like when you were working on the film that that was sort of an exceptional one? Like I know as a, as a, yeah, as a camera I mean, person, sometimes you can tell like, I'm not gonna go watch this after or I'm gonna go watch this, but you get more of the refined version to, to see. So could you tell that it was like really something special? Yeah, I mean, just just the quality of the work I got there was, was at the time was amazing. You know, it's such yeah. a it's small company in a way. Um, but yeah, just it's just because of the first few films and it was the last one again and uh, there's a lot of excitement about it, so mm. Very it's cool. kind of yeah, fun to work on. So for people that don't know what you do, what is it you do as a visual effect person? So I guess I'm, I'm a compositor. Um, so a compositor is uh, the person who gets all the images from, a, from everyone else and puts them together and they give you the final image on the screen. So you kind of get your CG, you get the back plate, you get blue screen, green screen, um, you do all that stuff and you just put it together. It's a bit like Photoshop, I guess. I'm not sure lots of people use Photoshop, but it's like a moving right. version of that. Um, and then after doing that for a few, year, few years, you obviously uh, get to supervise a small team of compositors. I've, I've done that for a while. Um, and then uh, I, currently I'm a technical compositing supervisor. So I've kind of gone on to help in my current company. I help all the films with their tools and workflows and help and make sure they get supported so they can do the job they need to do. So it's more of a support role for the whole company now. So so you are so you essentially blend all the elements together. So when people do a shoot and 
Uh, they want to have some spaceship in the background, and then yeah. they want the forest to not be a forest and to be a moon or something. You'll take the, the person that was shot, the actual actor doing the thing, and then they mm -hmm. might shoot that spaceship separately, and then they might also have a digital element, maybe it's a total digital painting, yeah. and you take all these things and put them together for that final image and blend that. Yeah, I mean, we can probably talk about it, about some of the shots we did for the short film and, um, and trailer to kind of explain that a bit Definitely. better. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Well. yeah, I mean, on that note, we already have some, some, some questions here coming in from the audience. Uh, obviously, people are, are interested in, in visual effects and how this is done. Um, one of the questions that I think we wrote down ourselves as well, so that's great that that's uh, there's Perfect. some... Uh, Perfect. Everybody wants to know. Yeah. Um, what was the toughest shot for you to work on in the short film? So in the short film, um, toughest shot was, <coughs> was probably, well, I mean, there's a couple of answers. The, the one single shot that was the toughest one was the overhead. Uh, Crashed, crashed shuttle shot. Oh, right at the beginning. Yeah, because mm -hmm. um, I wanted to use miniatures for the whole short film to be true to the tril original trilogy because they didn't have CG back then. Yeah. So I was, I was planning to use uh, miniatures. And I did for most of the shots that you see because they give you a great, um, great uh, look. For example, you know, we did a shot with the, with the crashed uh, ship and then you just put the model where all the actors were, film it in a scaled position with the camera. You've got all this uh, correct lighting. Mm -hmm. um, if the scale's correct, all the perspective's right, and it's just, you can just put it in and it looks great. Um, the problem with miniatures is you, even though it seems contrary to the name, you need a miniature that's big enough. Yeah. You need a big miniature yeah. to look good. Perspective is really so, important when you're doing that. Um, obviously we can't, you know, the original films that the Star Destroyer is probably the size of this room or something, I don't know. Yeah, big. But we, so we had a big model for the, to the shuttle. Um, so okay, we got, I, had, I, had, the, I, had, uh... I had like a, one this size for the kind of, uh, you might have seen the making of VFX shots. It's just kind of a shuttle on a stick in front of a green screen and I just kind of did some angles and that was fine because it's quite far away. But for the overhead shot, we had an even bigger one. It wasn't quite big enough for, this, for the drone shot. So, so you guys hired a drone on the day. Mm -hmm. And it was flying so close to the shuttle's wingtip because it's huge. That shuttle is about fifty feet, or maybe maybe more. Right. Um, and because it's a miniature, and you have a camera that close, the depth of field doesn't work. You can't. It just looks like a miniature. So mm. we had to kind of fake that a bit with the CGI. So I still used the, the textures from the model. I projected it onto a three D model. So oh, to, I actually didn't know this. Just yeah. to touch on what Tom was saying there. So what we did on the day, uh, if you've seen the short film, uh, right near the start, we have that big overhead shots. It's top down uh, right after the shuttle has crashed and we, we pass over the shuttle and then through a bunch of trees looking over the tree canopies and we see our stormtroopers are there on the ground and, and you know, outside the ship. Uh, and so on the day, Mark and I hired a drone operator to, to get that shot above the trees and everything. Uh, and then we tried to match the move by taking a, a toy shuttle that we had, the same model, uh, it was about this big, uh, and we had our drone operator fly over it in the same <laughs> manner, doing a number of speeds and things, because we were trying to use it as a model. But like Tom said, uh, yeah. we just, we had the drone too close to the well, top. The model was like moving around and things like, like that. Yeah, because so. <laughs> I remember too, like we had, we had the drone so close that all the, you know, the, the, the wind or the downward force, whatever, was like mm. kicking up dust. And yeah, we just, we didn't really, have the right setup to go about that, did we? Yeah, because the problem was a real shot, the drone would have been touching the tip of the right, yeah. uh, shuttle. So it was a scale down, you had to be really close to it. And it was, so in the end, we just kind of held a camera and moved it along a few times. And so then... speaking of like speaking of that shot and perspective and stuff, did you use the footage that we had uh, for the perspective of going over sort of that dorsal fin? Because that's a big like, yeah. moment to sell the shot, right? Is the, the parallax that exists when you're when you're going over that. Yeah, so we tracked the, the 3D track of the um, of the environment. So we had that all match moves as they call it. Um, and then I had a, a, just off the internet, I got a simple model of the shuttle mm. and just matched it up to where it was on a day or where I wanted it to be. So that way you get the perspective. And then, and then I used the textures from the model. I just kind of projected it onto the, uh, the real model, onto the CG model. So, well, it looked great. But yeah, I mean, it, it, if you look closely, you can see some of the things slipping around and more time would have been great. And if I'd planned it a different way, it would have been good. But I mean, that's part of these projects. You don't totally. get the time you want and you yeah. have to say, okay, I've got to stop now. 
<laughs> we all we all know with with the maximum amount of money and, and big budgets we yeah. can all achieve yeah. just about anything. But when it comes well, to even with that, you can't always. But well, true, true, true. Yeah. <laughs> Not further. We we're certainly better prepared as yeah. well aware, that we work on on the big sets and stuff. But um, yeah, sometimes when you're doing the smaller things, you just got to work with what you got. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You you mentioned earlier that part of your job is also overseeing a team, so mm -hmm. managing uh, all the elements uh, until you at the end put them together. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people? worked with you on the visual effects uh, on the buckethead short film mm -hmm. and on the on the on the teaser that we just released uh probably on the on the short films 10 to 15 people um and almost a similar amount on on the trailer different people had different amounts of time they could contribute so some people could just do like a couple of weeks some mm -hmm. people could spend the whole time working on it so you know, it wasn't a full team working full time. Um, so yeah, it's about ten to fifteen on both. Right. And the you know, the trailer, the trailer's visual effects were probably more than the visual effects that we had on a short film. Just even though it was six shots, but they were like another Much level. More comprehensive. Yeah, yeah definitely. Lots, <laughs> we, were, lot going on. we were doing a lot more just compositing. I mean, we had the the opening shot, which is a full VFX shot in the short film, but for the teaser, it was a lot more like yeah. everything is, is visual effects elements except for. You know, physical troopers in there, and maybe like yeah. one item or something. I like to see that as a good test of what's what we can do coming up. We learned totally. a lot from that, so yeah, we try to push it quite far. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that question came from uh, our viewer, um, Pongrel. Pongrel, who is a great character. <laughs> Let's get to some more questions. Um, what do we have here? I thought you were prepared for this. I <laughs> thought so too. I was really like, he's going to throw a question out here and we're going to know what it is. Yeah, I just took a quick look at what Well, we have around here, yeah. so I've, I've got one for Tom here. Um, people would be interested too, like, it's great to know what you do and how you achieve these things. What kind of tools do you use? I know that was something, mm. you know, again, I'm an, I'm an on-set camera guy, so I don't know the, the devices, the applications, the software that you guys use to achieve these things. I mean, I, I use Nuke, um, which is a compositing package. Uh, but because that's what I know, and um, and I can use it really quickly. But when you say so, when you say it's a compositing package, this is where I get confused because there's like, from the programs that I know, and I don't know exactly what they mm -hmm. all do. There's like Cinema 4D, there's Blender, there's Nuke, there's Houdini. So you say Nuke is a compositing package. Yeah. So does that mean that it's that that software is tailored specifically for compositing? It is, but it's come a long way since then too. There's lots of three. There's a three D part to the program, so you can do a lot of lighting. Mm. and uh, 3D stuff in that package and and I know you know I, I know this question comes up a lot and I'm, uh, it's not the I wouldn't say it's necessarily the best package it's like the one that just people use and it's got their um, got their first I think and a lot of the big companies use it but it, you know you can get just as good results from something like After Effects or Fusion which is a great package um, or other ones even just like Natron's a free one um, some you mentioned that even packages like Blender have a compositing aspect, so right. it doesn't matter if you can't. I mean, Nuke has a commercial free version which you can play around with, but it doesn't matter what package you use really. It's so it how you use it. So they all do the same thing. In yeah, and you can kind of get there with all of them really. It's just yeah. uh, basically the one you know the best is the one you should use because then you can kind of get the best results out of it. I wouldn't bother relearning ones particularly if you it's fair to say then for like for our viewers who are maybe looking at getting into visual effects or stuff it doesn't really matter what uh package you're picking up just kind of choose one and start yeah. to learn it and you can really achieve just about any kind of visual effect mm -hmm. you want in them but they all have sort of a different process and different hotkeys and yeah. things like that yeah yeah oh, very cool well in that in that same vein um we we introduced you on the live stream uh, on Saturday with the picture of you holding up the balls. Oh, yeah. We are all familiar with the balls, <laughs> but not all, of our, not all of our viewers might be familiar with the balls. Uh, so you just love calling them the balls. That's yeah. what we call them. We call them the balls. That's what they are. Take uh, two foot balls. Take yeah, I, saw, balls. I saw one of your friends or someone go, oh, no, the balls, you know, because I imagine for you guys, it's like, why are these people bringing out these things again and getting well, in the for, way. <laughs> I mean, we, we understand it. I'm sure for first ADs, it's like, okay, let's move on. No, 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 no don't touch the lights, don't touch anything. We gotta get the balls in there. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what we're referencing, if you if you look at our uh, post yesterday on any of our social medias, it's a picture of Tom holding up two different balls. One is like a chrome ball and one is a uh, flat gray ball. So what, what are the balls for? Why do we use these things? So, I mean, the short answer is uh, reference. 
<coughs> lighting reference. But I'll go into some more detail just because people might be interested. Um, basically, the grey the grey ball is there for diffuse lighting, um, and it's great kind of visual reference for the lighting on the day. Um, and the idea being, you um, the lighting setup is the same as the, the the setup when you actually do the, the filming. Quickly before you start filming, or at the very end of the shot, you hold up the grey ball um, for a few frames, and then um, when you come to light the shot. Uh, as a lighter, um, you can basically put CG uh, grey ball in there, so they're kind of side by side, and you light that grey ball in a similar way, um, and you can see. So if you've got like a grey ball with a lot of light on this side, you do the same lighting um, on the, in, in CG in the match. It's a good reference. You know, you're getting close to the onset set lighting. And just to, just to touch on that a little bit more, so it's not so much. It, correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is my understanding too. Uh, it's not so much that you're looking necessarily always at like how the light is to your eye on those gray balls, but that with that uh, particular shade of gray, you can tell your exposure value, and then based on your exposure value, mm. you can you can adjust the lighting so that it matches more appropriately. It's not yeah. so much like looking at it, but using the tools within the software to say, okay, this is properly exposed now because I can see the value on this gray ball. Yeah. Also, you have this uh, thing called a Macbeth chart that you hold up and it's got all yeah. these colors. That's used more for that. I mean, you can use, so the ball is 50% gray. Um, so, you know, if you match to that, it's good reference to what 50% what gray should be. And then you have right. a Macbeth chart they sometimes hold up, which has got all these colored squares in it. And that's good reference too for all the uh, colors of, of when you're filming like a true reference because you know you may have like a blue light and you go well i know this color um this chart is this so you adjust it to compensate for these kind of make your shot look neutral basically right. neutralize a shot and then you can grade it to a different color if you want so mm -hmm. that's slightly uh, you know makes it easier to kind of light if you're in neutral lighting and then the, and the chrome ball um that's more for uh, kind of reference of what the lights are on set because you can unwrap that sphere and it gives you like a, a picture of all the all the lights and you can kind of see that as a wrap it onto a sphere and you can see how all the lights positioned in the scene and you kind of match that. It's kind uh, of like a 360 degree camera where you just yeah. capture everything that was there on the day. Or like so an angled mirror. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean it's kind of it it's limited to the um, how much you can see but yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and 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 that and also gives you like a specular reference to the, the shiny ball and um as well as that i used a 360 camera um it's the theta uh, you may know it's a theta 360 camera mm. and basically i i had a kind of remote set up with my phone you put it where the actors are you take a bracketed exposure shot so you get like five pictures very dark very light and then you blend them together and, and Photoshop, yeah, high, di high, high dynamic range image, yeah. which you can then again use as lighting. You can actually light your scene with that 360 image. Um, and if it isn't quite what you want, you then just maybe add a light where the lights are in that image and you can tweak it or you can maybe paint some out because you don't like it or paint some in. So it's a, it's a good starting point as well. It's all those things give you a starting point and then you know where you are uh, on, on the day of the sh shooting and then you can elaborate from that you can then choose to maybe you know change it depending on the shot because it may be the actors that reference is only for where the actor is so maybe there's a whole other scene where there's different lighting but it gives you a good and that's, starting that's, point. that's actually a great point to touch on too so isn't it like if, if let's say you have a scene where there's a wall uh, down the middle and there's sort of two different light setups on each like kind of two two different mm -hmm. rooms that are closed off there's two different light setups, but you can see them both in the same frame you would then take your gray ball and your your chrome ball and go to each lighting setup because it's really about getting yeah I mean each you know different for example if you were going to do a visual you would you would uh, there'll be a shot with say a spaceship in the in the distance um, and then there's some action in the foreground so in theory you'd want the guy with the balls to start at the spaceship and like walk from there to the foreground the foreground right. um, right. it gives you kind of reference of the whole shot right um, yeah that makes so sense so wherever there's stuff that's being lit in the shot you want to have reference so you, you often see on the big film sets they're walking all over the place to make sure they get as much as they can right very cool yeah the Macbeth chair too is a good one uh, that you mentioned because i think a lot of people uh when they're first learning about filming and stuff think that's just for coloring afterwards mm -hmm. um but it's you know even when you're doing visual effects you you as the visual effects artist are trying to match as closely as you can yeah. to the coloring on the day based on our color temperature and um, you know things like that so so it's equally very valuable for you mm -hmm. guys for that 
Yeah, because we, we, we want to work on the shot neutrally usually, and then we'll have a grade from you guys that we put on top. So you have a neutral shot, and then we have a then we put your grade on top to see what it's going to look like. So constantly, um, mm -hmm. if you were to work through a very strong grade, it's difficult. Yeah. So. We have a follow up question here on that topic from uh, David Conant who asks. I thought photogrammetry and 360 cameras replaced chrome balls. I, I understand that you can still use either one based well, the on idea, the portfolio, right? Yeah, you want to use both because yeah. uh, if you just had the 360 picture, it doesn't give you... some. I mean, they've tried putting the grey uh, chrome ball in the 360 picture as well. Oh. Um, but the, the thing is, the more the better. So um, often uh, these two, the kind of... Gr the uh, grey and chrome ball uh, in like lighting slap slap comps. You're, the artists will present their slap comps with the CG balls, and then you've got the real balls, and then the uh, supervisor can like look at that as reference. Say, okay, that's a pretty close match. Um, you know, so that so they still use them now, even in the in the big companies. You want to use both. You don't want to use one or the other. Really. If if our uh, you know if our viewers or anything again anybody who's watching that wants to get into filming or anything like that. If they didn't have access to those balls, or they couldn't make them themselves, or something, can you get away with like a 360 cam to do, you know, as much as you could, oh, yeah. visual yeah. effect-wise? Yeah, either anything's better than nothing. So, right. and, and the chrome balls, you could like go to a garden center and you can get these big uh, chrome, um, what would they be called? Like garden objects. I don't know. Yeah, I suppose it doesn't necessarily but have to be chrome, you can, as long as it's a You can surface. find something. I've kind of read that's where people go if they want a cheap one. And then the chrome ball. The you, DIY you, method. You could yeah. you could uh, make one yourself by buying a, a can of spray paint and spraying something. I don't know. Right. And sometimes they have like half and half. So one half is grey, one half is grey. And you just that's what I've seen most of the yeah. time. Yeah, it's the, the half and half. Well, the halfer. That was a really great ball talk. <laughs> <laughs> we knew you could talk so much about. This, this show is not for kids, yeah. folks. It's not for kids. Excellent. Um, we have some more questions about specific visual effect shots. Sure. But I think before we get into those, uh, there's a question about our Patreon that we should that we should address. I yes. Um, Ragnarsson says, uh, "What if you don't achieve the Patreon goals that you say you need? Will you still make a pilot episode?" Oh, yes. So yes. We, we have definitely talked about this before. Uh, regardless of what happens with the Patreon, we will make episode one. After that point, uh, we're really at the whim of the fandom. Uh, Marco and I are not extremely wealthy individuals or anything like that. We did fund the first short film entirely by ourselves. It cost about 15,000 Canadian, so that's a good chunk of change for us. Um, so, so again, we've, we've agreed to ourselves and to, to our fans that uh, we will make episode one no matter what, even if we have to fund a bunch of it out of our pockets. But after that, it's very much up to the fandom to help us keep this going by supporting us uh, on the project. We also talked about the possibility of uh, just divvying up episode one into shorter, uh, sh shorter chunks, yeah. depending on how the Patreon goes. So we're not willing to, to compromise on quality at all, but we might be able to just tackle it in smaller bits. And, and that is to uh, ultimately to get it out to you guys faster yes. because we could just wait until the Patreon garners the money that we need, which is like about $30,000. And at this rate, that's going to take a great many months that people are probably not willing to wait for, us included. Uh, so to do it faster, we, we may end up breaking it up into chunks. And then once we have, uh, you know, we, we'd release them as we're done them. So like five to 10 minute uh, sort of chunks. And then once they're all released, we would likely recut it into a super cut of episode one because we uh, just, you know, that's the way the script was created. Um, and we don't want to ruin the integrity of the episode by having artificial cliffhangers and stuff. So we would we re-edit it so you guys can see what it was meant to be. Yeah, that is the answer <laughs> to that question. Um, <laughs> no, uh, back into visual effects, sort of on the same Note, um, will the series have special effects as good as a short film or will more footage, as in more runtime, mean uh, lower quality in effects? And I think the answer to that is... Uh, I think you just leave them on the screen there too. Just keep them with us. Yeah. Keep them with us. With us. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we both have an input on this. So what I, I think what we can say is that um, we're keenly aware, again, that, that this we're not sacrificing the good of the film, the good aspect, uh, how, how good the picture quality is, the production quality. So that is uh, very much on Marco and, and my mind. And uh, we wouldn't have hired Tom unless we knew that he could do this, and, and he absolutely can. So from your guys' perspective, how does that, how does that affect you having more runtime? Um, 
You mean having more time to do the effects or? No, no, that we're looking oh, to do like 30 minute episodes right, yeah. as a short film. Well, the thing, I think it's, it's all about, um, there may be more effects, but then I'm hoping we'll get more time and we'll, we'll plan them a bit better because it's based on getting the, the money from the Patreon. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe doing them in chunks will help space out the work. Um, and we, if we plan the, it's about planning the effects, you know, you don't want like, Kind of ten massive effects at the start of the, uh, at the start of the first episode. You want to have a few big shots and then a few smaller effects just to make it workable. So we need to kind of plan that out so that we can make, you know, one really cool shot um, and then lots of like some of the smaller shots. Uh, I was about to say what was in the first episode there. <laughs> well, Careful. We can uh, we can we can reveal that. We can reveal the, yeah. what you were going to talk about the opening of. Well, just like yeah. Just the biggest visual effect shots uh, shot of episode one. I, would, I think I think I think I think the 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 part that we're working on now. Yeah. Um, we should leave out because that's near the end of episode one. But the but the opening stuff I think we can talk about because it's right at the opening of F one. So. Um, yeah, we're we're very clearly working ahead as much as we can. That's always sort of our modus operandi, right? Um, while we're working on other uh, aspects of production and stuff, we're doing everything that we can to get things ready to go. Uh, and that includes the visual effects. So we've had Tom and his team start working on a, uh, a large opening space battle because it's Star Wars and we like starting in space. Uh, and we are starting with the Battle of Endor. So that's kind of what you guys have been tackling for a while. Yeah, and we're, we're really lucky from the short, from the, the teaser, we, we managed Obviously, in the short film, I didn't really have many uh, light. I didn't have any lighters, I don't think, apart from me, and I'm not a very good lighter. So um, I, was, I, thought it was good. I was glad <laughs> that uh, in the teaser we discovered some really great uh, uh, members of the visual effects team. So we've got an amazing lighter uh, called Francois, and then um, an animator Brandon. So yes. those two guys alone are just amazing to have now because we can start doing full CG shots, playing around with them. Mm -hmm. um, and getting the models, the, the CG models looking good. So that's a way to get ahead of the game now. We're planning out the full CG shots now before yeah. shooting, and that, rather than wait for shooting, then do everything then because that's that's where um, you kind of run into trouble. So for you, it's, it's great to that. yeah, it's great to get ahead yeah. of this stuff, and we can. And the more time you have, the better it can look. Everyone's doing this in their spare time, so I mean, thanks to my. My wife and kids for putting up with me doing this and supporting me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Tom's wife and kids. They always kids appreciate for it. Work when they us. see the end project. They all, they always appreciate it. Uh, but um, yeah, everyone's doing it in their spare time. So I mean, doing visual effects uh, just for a job is hard enough. You just never seem to have enough time. You always seem to be doing overtime. Uh, visual effects artists, it's a hard job to do. Um, Definitely. But doing it in your spare time and making it look as good as you can is another tough aspect because you have to compromised a bit because it's a short film you don't haven't got all the support of a big you know company so it's mm -hmm. just picking the battles of go okay well you know you know a visual effects shot's never finished um you could go on any shot could just go on forever but yeah, it, totally. it finishes when you run out of time or money um yeah and probably something else too but i can't remember <laughs> and what, what you just said is definitely one of the biggest challenges we face with this project is everyone is working on it in their spare time Everyone has, has regular jobs they need to work uh, because that's how, unfortunately, yeah. our society is set up. Uh, which, but yes, yeah. which is also again why we need the yes. help of, of everyone, uh, you know, to donate to the project. If if you guys really want to see this, um, we do all only have so much time to, to work on this, and uh, the more money that we can attach to the project, uh, the more crew that we can bring on, and the more that people can donate their time to do stuff. Hmm. Uh, so it just it just helps us get it to you guys faster. I know some people sometimes think like, why am I giving them money? But the the realistic answer is just that these things take money to make. They take time. Uh, we have to feed people. Sometimes we have to download licenses. Sometimes uh, we want to pay our crew because they're donating a ton of time. So uh, that's where all the money goes. And by pay, we really mean gas money and uh, well, wait. something for the day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And again, we want to pay the crew, but it always comes down to how much money do we actually have attached to the project, and are we going to sacrifice picture quality so yeah. that um, we're paying people? And it also comes down to how excited are people to volunteer. There's there's really a ton of factors that we have to think about when we're doing these things. I wanted to before we go to another question, I just wanted yeah. to really quickly. I thought this was a great segue. Um, Tom, you kind of mentioned that on these short film projects, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times we sacrifice a little bit because, again, it's, it's donating time, mm -hmm. we just don't have all the time to uh, really, really polish things. 
but we try to do our best in pre-production to avoid having to sacrifice always. Oh yeah. So what is what is in, in your description as best you can? What is the way that as a visual effect artist it helps you achieve that shot without having to make those sacrifices? What's like the correct pipeline to go about getting the shot that people were thinking of? Well, I've seen it done the right way and wrong way <clears throat> in terms of um <coughs> sorry. Okay, do you want a glass of water? I uh, offered you one. I think my cat. Okay. Um you know, even big budget films don't get it right always. You see some, some films, they're almost just making up the shots as they go along, um, right. and that puts a lot of pressure on the visual effects, uh, and you probably don't get the best work out of it if, if you approach it that way. Um, but sometimes that, that's just the way films work. And then you get other films, like a Chris Nolan film or something like that, and he, he meticu meticulously plans it, um, uh, brings in the visual effects crew early on, they discuss the best way to shoot things and get the best results from doing it that way. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, as you say, the best way is to is to have an idea of the shot and then um, depending on the shot, you may uh, storyboard it or you may go into um, even like virtual production side and, and work out the virtual cameras in advance and get some pre-visualization pre in there, which is just some basic kind of grayscale models of the action the camera, again, it all depends on the shot. Um, so as much of that planning you can do early on so that the director can get his vision of what the shot should be um, before you start working on the shot, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time and money. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys um, put together some great storyboards for the trailer, so when we're working on that, it was great to have that imagery. <clears throat> I mean, it'd be fun to actually look at that at some point to yeah. to compare the shots to the storyboard to see how similar they are. <coughs> set that up for today. We'll have to have you back. Yeah, it's a bit like at the end of Mandalorian, you often see the artwork from the film. Right, yeah. And then you see, wow, that's really close to what they actually... I'm assuming they did that first and they didn't just do it after. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that really helps just having a clear direction early yeah. on. Um, things may change, of course, but uh, having that early on is good. Then you, then you get to the point where you... Um, can work up the assets in the shot. Say you've got a, a CG spaceship and you know exactly that it's gonna be this part of the shot, uh, the ship you see. So you work up the detail on that. You don't bother on the back bit if you haven't got time. You know, if you didn't know that, you may have an artist working on the model to make all of it look good, but then they're wasting time uh, for that shot right. because you're only seeing a certain part of it. Um, so you, you wanna work up the scene for the shot, you know. Um, so having that clearly set out helps and then when you come to filming because you know what it should look like you can line up everything correctly position stuff uh, like for example the hanger shot and our teaser was shot in two different times and locations well, um, yeah. you know uh, we so talked yeah. about that I think in in another live stream about how was the last one yeah yeah so the the shot Tom is talking about is the uh, hanger shot in the teaser trailer where Mark Mirror walks in and then he turns around and he looks at camera and he puts his, his helmet on and then he walks towards like an a Imperial transport where some stormtroopers are getting on and we shot that in two entirely different locations before we had done any pre-visualization for it. We, Six months apart. Yeah, yeah we came up, <laughs> Mark and I came up with that idea in our mind. We <clears throat> shot it with Mark Mir in a hotel room, a uh, very small hotel room, so we had to take pictures of our lighting setup so that we could give them to Tom. We at least mm. were smart enough to do that. Uh, and that helped. And we, we also did, a lot of times when you're doing these visual effects from the camera perspective, you're doing things like measuring the tilt of the yeah. camera because you need to match the, the background of the plate shot to that or any, any other elements in there really. Um, you're also measuring the height of the flange, the center of the flange. The flange is what the lens sits in. Um, so the height of the center of the flange off the ground so that you know how high your camera was. Um, your depth of field and where it travels to. So if you're racking your focus from a foreground character to a background character, you need to know that foreground guy is uh, five feet from camera and the background guy is 15 feet from camera. Uh, and then really it's, it's almost all the information you possibly could give someone. Yeah. So um, the, the focal length, um, the uh, T-stop or the, you know, your iris, your whatever that was set to. Uh, yeah, really the, the maximum amount of information you can pass them is great. Um, so yeah. just, just to reiterate sort of what you said for anybody uh, who's looking at doing visual effects and wants to learn these things, um, pre-visualization pre yeah. is huge. Even if you don't have the ability to do it with software, just sketching out, uh, even if it's yourself, little chicken drawings or things, but then you know 
you know, what's, what's in the director's brain and you can give it to your visual effect people and say, you know, this is exactly what I'm thinking of. There's a sun in the background and there's a planet here and it saves a lot of time uh, where otherwise an artist might go and make you something and then the director goes, well, that's not at all what I described. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I wanted this other thing. Um, and on, yeah. on that note, I think uh, there's something else we can, we can share um, possibly later today or in the coming days on our Patreon, which is sort of the, the previous artwork that we have for every single visual effect shot in the teaser, because that's exactly how we approached it. We had first sketched it out, mm -hmm. then we had um, an, an artist, or actually several artists, make them nice so they actually convey exactly what we want and we handed these artwork pieces to tom so he had he had a reference this is what we would like this is what we're trying to build yeah and that really uh was crucial for the teaser mm -hmm. especially with the time constraints you can, see, yeah. you can see how how even with that the shots change because the, uh, the funniest well, the, the <laughs> I, I, I already know Let's which break shot, on that you're, shot you're talking about we all we all know this shot well, the first shot. Yeah, but, yeah, because yeah, that shot was a funny shot because uh, I thought that would be the easiest shot because basically the way it was sold by you guys was we're gonna have a stormtrooper on this on the ground and a smoke machine behind us like a white background and, I, and you just need to add lasers and I thought great that that shot just a couple of blaster shots have done that done that before and then on the day it was uh, like oh we're not doing the white screen it's gonna be a green screen now because uh, and the smoke. We just had, let's just add the smoke and VFX because it mm -hmm. um, won't work. I was like, okay. I mean, which isn't a bad idea because if you <clears throat> do stuff on a green screen without smoke, you, you've got more control. Sometimes you lock things down if you put the smoke on in the shot. Often we'll like, ask people, you know, if there's like a shot outside with drifting smoke, we'd have the option of not having that shot so we can add it later. So that wasn't, that wasn't like a, you know, a bad thing really. And then um, we had the onset mortar cannon, which mm -hmm. was great. Cause we had two, we had two yeah, I mean, onset that's, <coughs> and that's another great thing to mention about people yeah. if they want to do visual effects. The more onset real effects you have, the better it looks when you add your visual effects. And, and I'm going off topic here slightly, but to, to mention the shot in our short film where the explosion, the imploder, which yeah. you've got on the desk there. Yes, we do. We, have, we brought the thermal imploder today. The, uh, that shot again. You had like a, it, sometimes yeah, it the lights work. come on. Sometimes <laughs> the lights don't. It needs some wiring. Don't turn it on. It's, it's, it's <laughs> <a bit laughs> yeah, stop it. I deactivated it. Um, <laughs> we, we actually added the 501st on there. It's actually not engraved, as you can see. Yeah, I yeah. The engraving the, was done. In but the uh, the explosion cool. there was like a cannon which had like loads of debris in it that kind of blew up. And then the, the, the artist who worked on that shot had that as reference, and he added. Um, explosion on top of that and because when you've got the both together you've got this great combination of something where you go oh, I can't quite tell what's an effect or not because the stuff in the in the shot is moving and then there's an explosion and so that's a good tip to people if, if they want to do visual effects but going back to that that first shot um it just grew and grew I mean we we got it to a point where we had uh, I just put some smoke in the background and like a, a faint mountain in the distance it looked pretty mm -hmm. good and then we had the Fortune of, an, of an, this great animator on the show. Yes, Brandon, Brandon did a heck of a lot for that shot with the. Yeah. So, all, so only in, in the shot that we're talking about, this is the uh, opening shot, or really opening two shots of the teaser trailer where the stormtroopers on the ground and there's guys in the background and they're, they're running by and there's sort of a battle scene there. Um, only the guy on the ground in the foreground and there's one foreground wipe where you see like the thigh of a stormtrooper go by are real. Uh, and, and we added all of the uh, stormtroopers, or Brandon added all of the stormtroopers in the background. Yeah. They're, they're just uh, it's a really, It's a big talk. Animating all those different characters is a big job, and he did mm -hmm. it so well and quickly. Um, it, he did it in like two days. Yeah, right? it's crazy, because I know from awesome. I know that's not, it's, awesome. not, it's not easy to do that. And uh, yeah. that's why I never would have thought we could have done it, so it never entered yeah. mind. And then uh, our light to Francois got... Uh, some a great model. Um, I think well, I don't know who got the model, but he he reconfigured it. And uh, oh, actually, Will Inglis helped us re-rig it because um, right. it was a bit broken. So uh, there's a there's a obscure, kind of slightly obscure job called um, not the job's obscure, but people wouldn't know about it called rigging. It's all about you have a build a character, you put all the joints inside, and you've got to make sure the kind of arm and the Kind of like if you're talking about a marionette, yeah, right? it's, like, it's like where the points on a marionette would connect so that you can move it, it's, it's, it's a digital done, version of that. It's done badly, it looks very weird when you animate something, someone had to fix that, and that was great, Will could do that, and then um, 
light it in a convincing way. And yeah, I just, I, I wouldn't have believed that it was possible. If we design, designed that shot that way, I wouldn't have thought it was possible. But I'm starting nice. to learn now that I should just let you guys, I shouldn't try and say, oh no, that's going to be too difficult. I'm going to just say, yep, yeah, whatever. And then we'll <laughs> well, we, I mean, and that's, so I, I want to say two things. I mean, A, that sentiment is too difficult. We don't want to do it. Um, or, or not that we don't want to do it, but can we do it? Is something that we're trying to break away from too, right? Like we're always trying to grow as as directors, directors of photography and camera people. Yeah. Uh, and we had that, you know, with with you were obviously a major part of this, but that shot of the doll transitioning, right? That was a big transition that took quite a bit of thought as to like how would we go about achieving this? What plate shots do we need? How would we integrate it? How do we have to light that doll so she fits in the other scene? Um, there was a, a lot of things for that when we mm. talked about it. And I know when Mark and I initially talked about it, he was like, I don't know, man. And I was like, no, we need to do something new and fresh and cool and let's go for the moon and see if it works out. And I think the idea grew on us. It was definitely daunting to think of at first, but uh, uh, you know, the more you just think about it and, and put your mental game, uh, or get on your mental game, uh, you, you can really start to realize how they're done. And you got a chance to dress up in a green more so <laughs> only only my arm oh, okay. <laughs> my, maybe i had the head on too but yeah there's just a real the arms, yeah. you always real have to have someone wearing that if it's a proper visual effects shot you need to yeah, have some. real ridiculous behind the scenes <laughs> shot of me with that one one other thing i just want to quickly talk uh touch on is that that again is a great example of pre-visualization the problem i think we found with that shot is that marco and i based the shot when we thought of it on a very popular mm. uh, piece of imagery that already existed online of a stormtrooper on his hands and knees bleeding out of his chest or it might be his mouth or something uh and it's like kind of a wide shot you see his full body and the background is uh a battle scene it's practical smoke there's like a blaster fire going by there might be an explosion but no other stormtroopers but nothing else yeah and so this was this is what we based it on so we took this as reference art and then we never had a storyboard artist recreate that shot as we saw it. Um, and, and so I think we, somewhere along the lines there, if we had done a bit more pre-visualization, I think we would have seen more clearly that what was in Marco in my head felt a bit flat. It felt a bit, uh, there wasn't enough in it. And I think something that, that ultimately got added, like there was two things that really saved that shot in my opinion. Um, the stormtroopers in the background, which Brandon was amazing about, but also the, the embers. It, that was a very last minute decision. And again, if you go watch the shot, uh, first and second shot in the teaser trailer, you will notice there are orange embers floating. It's and the one they, splash of color in there. It's, it's mm -hmm. not only the one splash of color, but it creates an immense amount of depth because we added um, embers that were very close to camera, so they were, they were hazy and out of focus, and then we added other ones that were in focus, and then we added other ones even further in the background mm -hmm. that were yet again out of focus. So that, that helped create that layer of depth to the shot yeah. that was otherwise quite flat. I think the lesson there was that just because something works as a still image, uh, it might not work the same way once you turn it into Truth. a moving image, right? That was yeah. when we, we looked at this one piece of artwork and we're like, yeah, that's a great artwork. But <laughs> if, if you if you have it moving for what, like 10 seconds, it's just not enough to stand on its own, right? Yeah, and yeah. something else, one, one last thing that we did as an editing choice to help that shot too is uh, we added a very slight digital push-in. I, I guess you can't really see because my hands are, are moving towards <laughs> the camera. But uh, a very slight digital push-in and we, we again, felt that that really helped eliminate sort of the, the flatness of the shot. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, here's a follow-up question for Tom based on what mm -hmm. he was talking about from uh, David Conant again, who uh, uh, he reads like he definitely knows a little bit about visual effects. Mm -hmm. um, once the CG trooper is rigged and weight painted, couldn't the movement be achieved quickly from motion capture libraries? It could if we had access to that, but at the moment we don't. So, yeah. I mean, Motion capture libraries, yeah, I mean, I'm not really an expert at that, but that we could do that. Um, and yeah. maybe maybe Brendan used that yeah. as a starting point for all we Would know. Would we be able to perhaps pull animations from, say, video games or video game engines? Possibly. The, the other thing is that we do know uh, some very high-end motion capture individuals. Yeah, well, that's, the other, that's the other thing you can, I mean, this, the suits to get a, a kind of, movie quality motion capture suit they're thousands of pounds of dollars sorry and uh, we're in Canada, we're in Canada. Well, both they're, they're thousands of everything wow that's really heavy <laughs> <laughs> um so you could you know if you want to do your own motion capture that's something you want to do but that that requires a certain setup and i think well you're just saying you've got friends who have access to that maybe yeah we do know so so actually an individual who helped us in the trailer jesse hutch uh he was the ravager in the trailer uh, has done quite a bit of motion capture work. Right. Um, I believe it was him who was the 
the motion capture artist who was Marcus Phoenix in mm -hmm. Gears of War. I think, I think that was Jesse. Don't quote me, fact check me. Um, but uh, anyways, I know he does a lot of high-end visual effects work. Mm -hmm. He knows uh, individuals with the studios to do it. And he even knows, we, we talked about this for a different project that never came to fruition, but he even knows a guy, I don't know if he's here or Toronto, but he owns a motion capture studio that also has the rigging to do uh, moving wire mm -hmm. pulls. So you could do a wire pull on a 90 degree and like keep it going. So you can do some really intense, like, you know, if you're doing say like a ninja thing, you need ninjas to fly around right. so they can pull them around and do it. Um, and then there was a, actually the other guy I know uh, cuts my hair, uh, Donovan Stinson, who is a, a man of many talents. Yeah, I don't know, he's like, a, on one hand he's like a barber and on the other hand he does some very high end motion capture stuff too and knows some individuals. Mm -hmm. So we, we have some options there. It's certainly not something that I had really thought yeah. about using for this, but um, that's a, great. It's a good point too, I'm sure there's a library of motion capture you can probably buy stuff mm -hmm. from. Right. Or, so even, even if you can't have access to that, you could grab that if you want to make your own animation. Yeah. Definitely. Very cool. Well, David, thank you very much for the yeah. tip. And if you know cool. of any accessible motion capture libraries, please let us know. Uh, you can either leave it in the chat or send us an email. Uh, we have it, where is it? Up there in, in that corner, <laughs> info.transferpictures.com. Thank you. And I think, yeah, I think we, we've said this before, but uh, we are a volunteer project. If people are looking to jump on the project, we, we certainly can't ever make any promises. Sometimes, as especially as people who, who already work in film know, uh, sometimes too many cooks in the kitchen is a thing and you just don't need all these people who aren't exactly doing all the things um, But in the same breath, you know, we're, we're very much always looking to expand the team So if people are interested in joining the project send us a, an email and tell us what you do and how you want to help out And uh, again, no promises, but it might it might work out. Yeah mm -hmm. um, Here's just a quick one JC studio says uh, you should make VFX breakdowns, and uh, I agree. We already did one for the short. We did, films. yeah. Uh, I think we will. We will be able to make a pretty cool VFX breakdown we for the teaser as well. Hey? Yeah, we talked about that. We yeah. do want to do that, and that would be great. Again, like you mentioned, showing the the um, pre visualization stuff we did. So that would yeah. really be good. Like here's the pre visualization, then here's how Tom actually did it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Or Tom. Yeah. I mean, there's already yeah, like Marcus said, there's already that uh, breakdown of a few shots on the short film yeah. on this channel. So. Yeah. Yeah, and have a look honestly, like come to think, think of shot one is really the only one that ended up deviating. No, quite a bit. No, <laughs> no, no. Uh, what's, what's because here? because actually, I, this is what oh, I thought you were going to totally talk about. Totally right. You're totally yeah, this right. Is what I yeah, thought you were going to yeah. talk about when you said this was shot two. I guess it'd be technically shot three. No, that, well, that, I was going to say that's the, the hardest one because yeah. of uh, so many bits in it. So many moving so let's, pieces. Let's talk about that Literally. one. That's a really cool one for a second. How we deviated. So so the. Real quick, <laughs> but before, before we do, before we do, the artwork is still yeah, is. part of that exact shot. Like at some shot, uh, sorry, at some point, that shot precisely represents yeah. the previous artwork. Yeah. It's just the the opening to it changed so, drastically. So yeah. what what the shot that we're talking about is again in the teaser trailer. This is the third shot, which is the stormtrooper. Uh, it's after the the camera that battlefield scene. The camera cuts to black and then it opens up on like a chest wound on a stormtrooper. And then he's he's floating outward from the camera into space, and then you see the the destroyed Death Star there. Um, so that again is a shot that we deviated a decent amount from the pre-visualization. Um, we what we did is when we shot it in studio, we had a green screen, we had an actor uh, with I think he had a marker for the chest wound. Yeah, yeah. And a marker for the chest wound, like a, a visual effect marker. So the chest wound didn't exist. Uh, and then we put him on a well, there, there were four, just if people wanted to know, there were like four. So, it, it, so, four. so, so you can so get like four, a four, visual four point track. Yeah. yeah, I think a Tracking. single marker never does you any good. Because yeah. he he's like twisting around, right. and scaling. Yeah. Uh, so what we did is we, we put those on him and then we sat him on the stool on our dolly, uh, which are 360 degree revolving stools. Wasn't necessarily the best thing to use, but you know, again, you're using whatever you have. And then we just had him spin around on the stool a few times. And we tried a couple things, like we tried that. I think we tried moving the camera a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but the initial idea was that he was going to already be in shot, I think. Yeah. And that he was going to revolve around so that he's facing camera. And we see that he's dead. And then the focus was going to fall off into the Death Star in the background, like the piece of the Death Star. And we, so we shot it that way, that's how we visualized it, and then we got it to post, and we were doing all the visual effects work, and we all kind of agreed as we saw it that it was just, it was lacking like an oomph. It was lacking the, you know, the, the intensity that we wanted to have out of the visual, which is that 
the yeah. Empire's dying, and that Death Star 2 is destroyed, and everybody on it was dead, including a bunch of stormtroopers. Uh, but we rescued that shot, and I think an incredibly cool way, because we, we shot this uh, at 4.6K resolution. So the more resolution you can get in any visual effects shot or element, the better, because it, it helps blend the VFX better, and it also helps if you want to trim things out or scope in on something. Uh, just gives you more room to work with before it becomes all pixelated and gross and you have big problems. Uh, so we shot at 4.6K, which allowed us to re-visualize the shot with what it became, that the stormtrooper would start very close to camera, and that's a digital zoom out is what it actually is. And, and when you blend it all together, it looks like the stormtrooper's moving, but it's really just a digital zoom out on that element, uh, starting at that chest wound and moving outward. So it was, it was really good that we shot it at such a high resolution. Yeah, well, you, I mean, we also we used uh, the, the focus defocuses to help us there because I, I kind of put them on a put them on a, in the 3D space and uh, connected up some defocus data with him. So he kind of as he drifted out, I set the focus point to be as he came into shot. So he basically was out of focus and then in focus. Then we rack focus to the Death Star. Right. Um, so that helped hide. Some of that, but that shot, yeah. I mean, my, my sons are great critics of my shots. Like when I'm writing them, and that was one of the shots. They're kind of going, yeah, no, that doesn't look really good. Uh, like that as you're making it or for the final one? No, they, they when we're all kind of working it up. Right, right, they're, right. they're happy with it at the end, but it was like, why can't you just like um, push him further away in the distance? And I go, well, we didn't shoot his legs, so we can't do yes. that. Yes, yeah, that was another. It's thing. like it looks like you're just scaling him. It's like, yeah, I'm um, kind of limited here. So he, they're very helpful in giving. Them so that, what, what you were saying there is another thing that we kind of faced with the shot is that, again, when we originally visualized it, we said to ourselves, well, we only really need him from like the waist up and that's it. And then when we changed the shot, you know, the further he gets away from the camera, the cooler the shot is. But because we only shot him from basically the waist up, it was like, well, we're really limited to push him away from camera until that, you know, we're, we're out of legs. And that, that's a shot where, show. oh, we could have used CG, but I just feel like the less CG you use and the more, because we've got these great access to everyone, everyone's like movie, uh, you know, replica armor from the 501st and yeah. uh, you want to use that as much as you can. Um, totally. But use CG stormtroopers when you want because, you know, we all, we've all seen Attack of the Clones and, you know, I mean, it's just, you can tell that they're not. And there's a, yeah, there's a rule. Real. There's a it looks common, much better when you've got people in the costume up close. There's a very common rule in, in filmmaking that uh, visual, if you go all the way visual effects and do everything visual effects, it just is not going to look as good as if you blend practical effects of real things with visual effects. And that means having as many real things, even if you're shooting them as separate plate shots and then putting them together is almost always going to look better mm -hmm. than uh, making a full digital scene or scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, sorry, quick sidebar, you just mentioned something that oh. reminded me. Uh, costuming, the 501st. Um, mm. You have a couple of screen accurate Star Wars costumes yourself, is that right? I do. Oh, which ones mm. are those? Couple, I've got I'm working on another one actually. Um, really? Cool. I've got a Stormtrooper, a New Hope uh, hero Stormtrooper, mm -hmm. oh, cool. and a Darth Vader, a New Hope Darth Vader. I didn't know you had a Darth well. Vader. Yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. And I've got, and I've just, I just bought Vader. Kylo Ren off someone too, so uh, yeah. oh, cool. ah, so nice. one day I mean, An Adam Driver. I just think Kylo yeah. Ren, he's got <laughs> such a recognizable face that whenever I talk about him, I just call him Adam Driver. Yeah, uh, but that reminds me too, um, I think we had this question written down yeah. and then never really came to it. Um, how you ended up drawing this project? And I, I, I remember this very clearly because it was, it was, the Canada Day Parade here in Vancouver. That was my first troop. Yeah, in 2017. Yeah, something That was like. your first troop. It was my first parade because I had I had joined not that much earlier before you. But um, that parade had the entire local garrison out, basically. So that was like the most stormtroopers we ever had in one place outside of Fan Expo, maybe. Um, but at that time, we were like probably a couple months away from filming Bucketheads. And I still needed uh, to just get more stormtroopers for our film. So I used the opportunity to just <laughs> ask people that I haven't asked before that, that I didn't know yet, the, the, the new members just like, hey, I'm making this, do you want to be in it? And you were one of those people. And then you said, <laughs> well, I can be a stormtrooper, but do you need any help with visual effects? At that point, we didn't have a visual effects person on board yet at all, right? No, that was, yeah, we were, we were searching out our first visual effect, effect people, and mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of filmmakers resonate this too, when you're doing your first projects, 
or uh, you haven't done a whole lot, you usually want to have something to show people so that you entice yeah. them and like, look, I, I kind of know what I'm doing. I don't suck. I've got a real story, whatever it is. Uh, but we didn't really have that when we approached you. We were sort of just like, this is what we want to do. Well, I mean, Marco, Marco dabbles in visual effects, so I think you, you had some tests that you'd done. But I guess uh, just allow... Well, you know, right? Yeah, what I, did, done? I did some really rough just... Uh, laser effects in, 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 in After Effects. Like I, uh, I don't know if I remember this. Um, I don't know if, if you know that, that Sable plugin from Video Copilot. I was experimenting around with that because it can repurpose it to, to just be a laser blast to yeah. a lightsaber, right? But um, I could have never even attempted any of those uh, effects that you ended up pulling up for the short film. But um, my question to you is, uh, what were you, your immediate thoughts when I, when I approached you during that parade? <laughs> and what, what, what made you say yes to that project? Um, well, I mean, just thinking, remembering back to that day is just funny because I remember how hot it was. It was July, and, and it's the first time I'd yeah. done a troop, and we're just all hanging out there with our helmets off because we were, you know, so hot as it was. We had to wait for like two hours at the muster yeah. point. Eh? And it's just funny the attention you get as well. So it was kind of just the whole experience was just fun. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then to have you just come up and ask that, I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and then, uh, so we caught you at the right time. Yeah, and then it was like, all like a new vision effects as well. I was kind yeah. of excited because I. I I met you once before at uh, an uh, armor building party, randomly. That's before right. I, and I was just seeing what it was, seeing what this thing was all about. And yeah. um, I remember you saying you're a camera operator. And uh, then it kind of made sense when I saw you again and why you were asking that. And I uh, thought it was a great opportunity to kind of work on something like this that's, you know, with lots of passionate people. And, uh, you know, it's not a big, run by a big company. And, you know, you have to do a certain thing a certain way. So it was just fun. Yeah. I knew you, I knew we'd all be able to work with everyone in the club too, and I just thought it's a great idea. And we've said it before, we are really only yeah. as good as our team. And you know, Marco and I dreamed up the the series and and continued to sort of be the showrunners. But at the same time, we could not do this without a great many people. And yeah, Tom, you have absolutely been here since the beginning, uh, and and your input is always extremely valuable. So yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, really quick here, we actually have a super chat donation coming in um, from. Uh, oh, actually, he's one of our patrons as well. As well, it's uh, Gerald. You got it right this time. Nailed it, Gerald. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, much thank you very much for the donation. Um, if anyone else wants to contribute to the project, uh, you can send us a super chat, or if you really want to help us out, check out our Patreon. That's the best way to support the film. We're Please very say thankful. If you really want to help us out. <laughs> Even giving money over the super chat is really helping us out. That's I, true. I know That's what you're true. saying. It's, yes. Ultimately, we get more of that money if it goes through the Patreon, but any of it is really helping us out. So thank you. Exactly. Uh, there was okay. There was quite a number of questions that we missed. I think some of them can be answered uh, pretty easily here. Um, so, so Just a clarification uh, question there. There's a, there's a few there. Yeah. So Emily McRae mentioned that she has a number of uh, BTS photos and things. Emily McRae is, is an individual who's worked with us on I think well really since the beginning as well, uh, doing a lot of help with the armor and things like that. She's also a member of the Five Hundred First. And um, amazing. And, well, and amazing, of course. <laughs> I didn't know I had to say that. Uh, and so she just asked, or she mentioned she's got a bunch of green screen photos and uh, sharing them is at our discretion. We do want to share these things with you guys. I think there are some already on uh, the social medias from when we did the short film, but we, we've got more from uh, the teaser and we'll continue to share those. We just, I don't know, I guess uh, in figuring out what is always the best thing to share with you guys, um, thought there was some other stuff first. But yeah, they, they will be coming, uh, so, so be excited for those. Um, uh, how many seasons are you all hoping for is another question here. Um, I mean, we're hoping to keep going as much as we can. We have talked already about doing season two. Uh, we don't necessarily have that story all lined up, but we have a good idea of where we would go with it in our heads. One season at a time for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, one season at a time. Like, again, we're, we're really still looking to pump this one up and get this one going, and it's going to take some time to get this done, and that the amount of time is really reflected on how much uh, donations we, we gather from people. So uh, the, more, the more donations, the faster we can do this, the more we can focus on the project, and the more we can get to season two. Um, there was a couple other ones there. Why'd you, why'd you move? Uh, there, here's, here's an interesting one that's very topical that um, I thought maybe we should answer. Someone asked, how does COVID affect the visual effects pipeline? Mm -hmm. How does this pandemic, is that going to affect us? Is that going to affect your guys' work? Does it affect your work right now on the, on the mm -hmm. big stuff? It affects us uh, in terms of the works running out now because when COVID hit we were at, at my work and 
you have projects on the run already they're being shot already so in the short term it was fine but as we approach you know September um, you know or further along the work starts to run out so it's, it's going to affect visual effects companies in that way and, and that's unfortunate because the most support from the government was early on given to people and that's when we were okay Mm-hmm. But we're going to need the support later on, and that's probably when the support dries up because people are starting to go back to work. But that's yeah. when we start running out of work. So. And I did, I did see, uh, I've seen it a few times. There's a petition going around right now that I signed uh, to ask. I don't know if it's the, it's probably the federal government to extend the emergency the the CERB uh, for uh, film workers in particular. Mm. Um, so I don't know if that's being looked at seriously or not, but I, I have seen that petition going yeah. around. And that's a good thing, you know. We can we can all uh, attribute to there contribute to that. I guess that discussion because Marco and I work uh, sometimes on set as camera people or camera technicians, um, and yeah, we haven't worked since the the pandemic started. Like there are no sets running; they're just starting up now. Um, but even so, it's a bit of a slow process uh, because the government has announced guidelines for how people can go back to work, especially in the film world. But what hasn't been talked about a whole ton is the fact that all of these film sets are insured. And right now there are no guidelines or no policies insuring uh, COVID-19. As far as I'm aware, I know that some of the bigger sets are getting up and running uh, and commercials and MOWs and things. But I, I don't know how these things are going because my understanding is that uh, the major challenges a lot of these bigger productions are still facing is that they cannot insure for COVID-19. So why, mm. you know, how can you keep going if your crew starts getting sick or your main actor gets sick or, or whatever? So, yeah. I mean, the one thing we can do on this project is work on the full CG shots. There's a bunch of them in the first episode. So, because we're all working from home, so mm-hmm. we can keep working. But um, that's one aspect. Um, the, the film, the companies that do feature animation they're obviously fine because they're, they're carrying on, but yeah. um, for us it's more tricky. So yeah, we're just gonna, fo- for now, and on this project, we'll focus on the full full CG shots and there's quite a few of them. I was so. gonna say, we'll, we'll keep you busy, Tom. Don't <laughs> yeah, worry, yeah. we'll keep you busy. So we'll just slowly do Sorry, that. Sorry, Tom's wife and yeah. children again. <laughs> <laughs> Mark will like that one. Uh, really, I'm sorry, but thank you. Um, we still have more questions here. Yeah, there's plenty. Uh, here's a quick fun one. So are you guys, Above Tatooine. <laughs> Clearly, we are in a uh, on the Death Star right now. Yes, we're clear. Wait, which hand is it? We're clearly <laughs> it's all real, and we're clearly above these things. We. It was Jakku, isn't that Jakku? Visual effects. I was gonna say the same thing. I don't. I think it's this Jakku. is a. It looks like Jakku. This is a, a. Is it a zoom? It's a zoom background. Background, yeah. yeah. So I don't know that they said which one it is, but I was gonna say Jakku too. But uh, it could be Tatooine. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's the bottom side of Tatooine you've never Maybe. seen. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. The dark side of Tatooine. Maybe. Yep. Uh, um, hmm. I see Actually, here, here's a good question from Lord Vader himself that we, we, we've Another sort of one. answered, but I think we can, we can get a little more into it too. How is production going so far? Um, what, what have you been working on so far? And I think um, right now our focus is really getting started on our opening, which is a sequence on Endor during um, the, the scene in episode six. So for that, we are probably going to um, go back to either the same or similar location from the short film, but we're going to dress it up a lot more. Yeah, so uh, again, how's production going? It, it's going well. Um, we have so many people, like for real, so many people yeah. that have uh, offered to volunteer and help on the project and, and really high caliber people who are very driven too. That's that's really important. You know, we, we do encounter that sometimes where people want to get into film and, and we're not opposed to taking new volunteers, but then they just don't have necessarily the drive to keep going. Uh, film work is, I think, uh, made into this fantasy sometimes that it's like as fun as the movie you watch. And while we all love what we do, it's a lot of hard work, like many hours on set and many, many more offset making sure that what happens on set goes correctly. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing right now. Emily already says, oh no, more dust. <laughs> Yes. We love yes. you, Emily. Uh, we, we make our crews work very hard, too. But that's how we make these things really good, and, and we achieve what we do. So production is going well. We, we are working as hard as we can in all things pre-production in securing the assets we'll need 
to make these things, like physical things, like props and costumes. Um, right now we're going through the design phase and a number of original things that we're incorporating. We've already talked about how we have an original droid that is being mm -hmm. built by the BC Droid Building uh, Club. Can't wait to show yeah. some of that. Super excited soon. to show yeah. that, totally. And it, it is coming soon. Um, so we're doing a lot of the design stuff. Um, we're doing, like Tom has talked about, a lot of the pre-visualization for visual effects. So that's uh, Marco and myself making sure that with a storyboard artist who up to this point has been Stuart Manson, uh, is, is, you know, we're, we're uh, scribbling down our thought and our picture of what we see the frame to be to make sure that when we get on set we really achieve that. Um, also working with Tom and the visual effects team to handle any of the pre-visualization we can do digitally or to just really set scenes up as best we can so that when we get in them we've, we've got the assets. Like I know, sorry, I know, I know we talked about the pre-visualization of the um, opening space battle that we're doing, mm -hmm. but like other things that you guys have done for the teaser trailer, uh, with again that shot of Mark Mir where he's walking into the star or the uh, the hangar on the Star Destroyer and he turns around and puts his helmet on. Um, you guys created a full digital environment, a three D mm -hmm. digital environment, and that's something that we're going to use on the short film. Yeah, yeah. And so that again is just kind of working ahead as much as we can to. Uh, get all the assets ready, um, but there again, there's a great many things to do uh, yet. And we're, really. When we're in visual effects size, we're also working out now, uh, uh, call it a bid, but it's not really a bid, but uh, you're just looking through all the shots and working out how long each shot will take, um, so we can make a timeline for that and I can tell you it's take five years to make or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, that, so that part of we can do on visual effects just planning out um, how we're going to schedule it all and how to um, make it work um, mm -hmm. so it doesn't you know, take forever. So. And another, another thing I guess for anyone who, who uh, doesn't make films or isn't into film work, uh, you know, as we talk about having a lot of these assets ready and having access to them already and working on them and whatnot, the, again the need for you guys to support us and to donate to us uh, is it comes into play especially when we go on to set we need to rent lights we need to rent power for those lights generators we need to rent transportation we need to feed the crews working we need to pay the crew if the transportation or if the if the set is far enough away we don't want people to burn a hundred dollars of gas coming out for four days to work with us or something you know we have to we have to reimburse them for that stuff uh, we, we really don't want people to lose money being on the project we're, we're very happy and fortunate that so many people are volunteering to help us we don't want to make them you know, burn their own money in, in assisting us. Um, so that'll either come from us or come from the Phantom. Um, yeah, there's a great many things that we can work on ahead of time, but there's still many things that we're going to need to pay for, uh, which, is, which is why we need your guys' help. Exactly. Uh, real quick here, Alex Gibson just uh, sent us a $5 super chat. Thank Ooh! you very much, Alex. Thank you, Alex. We appreciate it. Uh, and he asks, the visual effects for the short film were fantastic for a fan film. So great work on that. Are you using more practical or CGI, do you find? I think we kind of uh, already went over that, but I'm on, sure yeah, on that one it was more, on it. a lot more practical. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the breakdown, you'll see how the first shot was just kind of a model on a stick and then uh, added in the background. And then the, the kind of practical stuff of the crashed shuttle in the background of them chatting and it's kind of like on fire. That was quite a successful miniature sh shot where we um, yeah, just had the model exactly where the actors were so the lighting matched then we had like a scale you had to have the model off the ground so we could have a camera at the correct height based on the scale of the model because otherwise the camera would have been like in the ground so we had yeah. so it was raised up and then we kind of worked out how far the camera would be if it was that much smaller so we kind of to get all the perspective right and then yeah it enabled us to kind of make it match the yeah the scene but yeah it was main we tried to make it mainly practical and uh, another thing i wanted to mention is that the blast a uh, uh, bigger effect than i realized was all the um the fire, firefight, uh, because, um, is that the right word for it? Fire, 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 blast yeah, fight. Yeah. I, think it was, I think it was bigger than any of us. Yeah, because it's like, we I remember we did a first pass of it and it was like, we, we kind of watched it and it was like firing the lasers and it was like, poo, it was like really yeah. kind of unexciting. These little lasers just coming out of the guns going, that doesn't look very dramatic. Yeah. They were just like sliding out these lasers. And so we added like muzzle flash, interactive lighting on the characters, like a bit of a warp on the, on the scene as they fired and that kind yeah. of, made it look a more, look more real, but just stuff like that, we didn't realise how much work we'd have to put in. So yeah, I, mean, I guess it was a lot, a lot of look development. What yeah. do glasses look like, what do uh, flares look like, all that, all that kind of stuff, right? And then all the, um, even we did a lot of work just 
when there were close-up shots of the troopers and those we, we kind of put reflections of the laser going into, across the helmet we kind of got a model of the those helmet are so yeah. good. it really um, helps sell the effect of, of that was the flashes lot, being real that was a lot more hard work than I thought because I was trying to do it in my own I was using the 3D aspect of my package but uh, right. That's harder than I thought it would be. But, yeah, yeah, so the two, two great things you said there. Uh, one for Alex uh, and, and anybody, again, who wants to see these things. Tom has done a visual effect breakdown uh, for the original short film. It is on our, tra our channel, pardon me. Uh, so you can check that out. We haven't done one yet for the teaser trailer, but that is coming. So we will have some uh, show and tell there. Uh, and then just one thing you touched on that we haven't really talked about today, especially when you're working with practical and visual effects together. Practical lighting, getting your lighting on the day is like the most important because it is extremely hard to replicate good looking lighting uh, mm -hmm. as a visual effect and blend it with already existing real lighting. That is really, really tough to do. Uh, Tom mentioned again that we had uh, visual effect lighting on the reflection of the stormtroopers in the short film. So when they take a shot, you can see this red glow that kind of crosses over their armor as it goes. That took some time for you guys mm -hmm. to achieve. We tried to do it in camera on the day, but we, we uh, again, didn't, I don't think we pre-visualized the fight scene, the blaster fight, uh, the firefight, well enough to have achieved that in camera. And that was a learning process for you and I, that we thought we could just go and say, yeah, there's a blaster fight here, Tom, and just put in <laughs> put in blaster shots and make it look good. And then, you the know, we could see all the things that we kind of missed when we should have been doing the previews on that. Well, to, I mean, to, to expand on that, we did do an, an, an entire previews uh, shoot on the firefight to just block it out and see how it cuts together. So it was just, I think it was you and I and our second AD and... and I think um, uh, our key grip was there. Yeah, it was like... Four or five. You were, you were holding like twigs, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. Not. I think we were just. Like, yeah, no, we had twigs for the run. I remember for the run. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. right, right. And our our stunt coordinator was there, Chad, and actually Troy. I think were there as who right. was. Basically, we shot the entire sequence uh, like a week before we were actually going to go to camera, um, and then cut it together just to see if it works. And in the process, we found several elements that uh, we we changed entirely because I think originally. Um, if you remember the short film, Troy, our main stormtrooper, he sprints out into the field, does that, does that dive to get the thermal detonator, and then he just goes into cover right where he is and throws it. Originally, what we thought was going to happen was uh, he was going to get the detonator, go back into cover where he came from, and throw it from there. But once we filmed it like that, we realized that doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you sprint out into oncoming fire? just to get, get all the way back where you came from if you've got the item that you need, right? Military tactics. <laughs> Yay! But to get, back to, to get back to what we were talking about, though, the thing that we didn't do that we learned in that previs is we didn't have any idea in your and my mind as the directors and, and the show creators, where were the blasters going to be? Where Where's the blaster fire going to be? How many are going to be on screen? We were just being very vague. It's just like, blaster fire comes from beyond those yeah. trees. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think, you know, knowing those things helps with directing and it very much helps with visual effects because, again, and we, you had to just figure it out as you go. People were taking shots on their own time and stuff. We didn't tell them when shots would be passing by their mm -hmm. heads or anything. Uh, and we had no practical lighting for that. So you really had to add that extra lighting and mm. other reflective surfaces. There was some cool stuff you shot, though, some of the ground impacts that you did. That, oh, was, yeah. yes. that was nice. I wanted to mention those earlier, too, because you, you kind of had talked about how getting your lighting on the day for visual effect elements is extremely important when you're doing it. Uh, and yeah, so, so we had some impacts on the ground where you can see the stormtroopers again in the, in the short film, you can see the stormtroopers have like jumped into a ditch and then there's some blaster fires that hit in front of them on the ground. Those, you know, you never, you never shoot things uh, at people on set, even if it's, unless you're, unless you're an utter pro and you have a great way to go about this, but I'll, I'll say for any independent filmmaker, don't use Zerg balls, don't use paint balls and shoot them at people. Um, the way to achieve that effect is take those elements and create them separately. So first we shot the stormtroopers in the ditch and we went through the scene and they did their things and then we took them out of the ditch uh, and then we shot some uh, visual effect elements specifically on the ground, like looking at the ground with a, a green screen background. So the light was the same as we had just shot the stormtroopers in the ditch and, and we got the dust to kick up by shooting uh, they mm -hmm. called absurd balls on the ground, little uh, paint balls full of dust basically. Uh, and that well, actually, that was a case where we put the green screen up, and it was so such a backlit shot, and it's so bright that everything was just the sun was shining right through it, so it didn't it work. Great. So we actually ran in with a black screen, 
Oh, so do we actually remember that? Yeah. Be yeah. prepared, yeah. Oh, and that worked, and that worked really well because it was backlit smoke against the black yeah, screen. And, but the green screen was like, oh my God, this is not going to well, work. And, and, and I was running like running to get it and we're running out of time and then I had to like change it to a black screen. And The other problem too was not was that we were in a forest. Yeah. So, so you've got really hard light everywhere and it's kicking off green all over because you're in a forest surrounded yeah. by trees with green leaves. So, yeah, that, so that, that was another part of it where we were like, oh, is this going to key well? Like, <laughs> yeah. is this going to do well? So we got the black screen and that worked. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also why uh, we always need a visual effects supervisor on set. Work we, we with a visual be, effects you know, supervisor they can tell you on set whether things will work or not. You know, if, again, if you're starting out, do as much as you can yourself and, and, and learn and make your projects and learn. But if you want to make something that is very high end and, and good quality and you don't know visual effects extremely well, work with a visual effects supervisor because they're people who will consult you on what you need to do to achieve your dream. Yeah, exactly. Um, That's right. <laughs> I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Uh, David has another follow-up question uh, as far as uh, social distancing and BFX uh, pipeline is concerned. Um, he says, you mentioned government policies regarding COVID-19. How has social distancing affected your pipeline for remote VFX and how does the workforce from different countries and policies come into play? Um, I went, well, before this COVID happened, there was a very strict rule with, with uh, the big companies like Disney, Marvel. You can't, you know, there are very strict security uh, policies in place. So working from home would never have been a, an option at that point because they'll be worried about content leaving the studio. <coughs> but um, they very soon realized when um, COVID happened that they had to like adapt to uh, this situation. So we all work from home, but we've got very, we're all, well, our company logs into our machine at work, so everything's still at work. We're just logging into it, and we've got we had a whole it's like remote access. Yeah, so like we, we're not doing it on our own machines. We're kind of remoting right. in, and there's very strict policies that we had to um, adhere to. Like we have to be in a room with a closed door. You know, you can't let other oh. people see your screen. So it's all the same rules you'd have as if you're at work. So, mm. and so far, so it's so good. You know, it's worked, and nothing yeah. bad's happened. We managed to keep working, and it was amazing how we set it up. So quickly. Just, so that, just that's how we managed to do it. I've never really thought about this, but like, does does the capabilities of your home machine affect that because you're remoting in? So like, if somebody owned an old computer at home, they just didn't care, or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure how that would work as a visual effect artist, but just say. Um, it's just well, it's just the that? well. Your, the main thing is the speed of your internet connection. So I'm I'm plugged in with my Ethernet cable. Right. Because it's it's how fast you can get the images uh, back from your machine. So I suppose that's that's all your. So you don't so you don't need to. A, a very good machine at home you need one that because um, it's just processing the graphics the actual processing that's happening yeah. for what you're doing is still on that yeah. machine yeah I mean it helps to have a good monitor uh, to see what you're doing so some of us have got monitors at home from work so you can right. see that but it's mainly that um, setting up the virtual machine and there's different settings so when you're doing a certain type of work you have a low quality setting because you don't need to worry about things but then um, you know that makes the bandwidth good for the whole company but if you're working on a shot where you've got to do frame by frame and looking at the grain or something you may have to temporarily put your settings up to a higher setting and then you'll be grabbing more bad bandwidth because the images will be higher quality but yeah. you need to do that so it's, it's finding that balance um, is it pretty strict for like streaming and stuff at work because of bandwidth how do you mean? Like, like uh, I mean, in like your own time, if, you know, if, if you're like on a break or something, are you, is it, is it sort of like, do they monitor, I guess, uh, your sites or anything you go to? Like, hey, you're on, you've been on YouTube a whole bunch and you're, oh, right, you're okay. streaming a whole ton of things, but we need that bandwidth because we have people rendering or, or working. Well, I guess that's shots. a different bandwidth because that's your own, there's a bandwidth of getting stuff from the company to you and then. Uh, I, I mean like when you're at work. Oh, like work, if, if yeah. If you were so, working in your. Well, your work, office. I mean, that's, that's completely locked down. So basically you can't just go on the internet. You have to go through this, log into this, through this other thing to go on and then that's all monitored. Because so, mm. basically you, you still want to have access to the internet so you can look at reference for things. Yeah, of course. There's yeah. no way for you to upload stuff to the internet is all locked down. Oh, it's, interesting. It's, uh, you can kind of, yes, yeah, so it's all monitored. Nothing can leave. No, nothing a lot can of leave. cyber security. <laughs> cyber. Well, we're coming up on 90 minutes on the stream here. So it's uh, almost noon. Okay. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about here? Um, I don't think so. Maybe we'll just reiterate one last time. Uh, you know, so this is going to be, uh, we're, what we're talking about today is, is the visual effects with Tom Rolfe, who is our uh, VFX supervisor on the short film, on the teaser trailer, on just about anything we're ever going to do, as long as yeah. we can keep him. Because uh, he is uh, very excellent at what he does. 
Um, but we are here to talk about largely season one, and uh, that's what these live streams are for, to let you guys know how things are going, answer your questions, talk about what we uh, have already done on past projects as well a little bit. Um, season one is going to be 20 to 30 minutes long. We are still creating episode one. We very much need everybody's help uh, who wants to watch these things, all the fans. Um, if you're in a position to give, please donate to the project through Patreon. Uh, it just helps us get you the product quicker. And as we have stated before, we will do episode one no matter what. But after that, if there just isn't enough monetary support for the project, we just have to, you know, figure figure out a different way, which might take years, we don't know, or sideline the project, we're not sure. But uh, to keep it coming out in a timely manner, we, we need people to donate to the project. And thank you to everyone who's already donated. Yeah. Uh, it, it couldn't happen without you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, anything else? Uh, I think that's it, boys. All right. <laughs> that means we'll see you at the next live stream uh, this coming weekend, hey? Uh, well, yeah, in a yeah. week. Yeah. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> in a week. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. All right. Bye-bye.